gangrenous. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Don't dream it. Be it. And Big Anklevich. Dreams don't come true. Dreams are made true. Hi everybody, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. Welcome to another episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Uh, and today we've got another story for you. Uh, the story is called M- M- My Porcelain Throne, My Porcelain God, My Porcelain uh, China. What is it? My, My Porcelain Something. My Porcelain Monster. Monster! Ah! By Eric Dean. Eric Dean is a writer. He, uh, it's also an artist. This story was published in Sharon Coin. Wait, C H A R O N. The... I think that's Karen. Yeah, say I, I should know that. I did an audiobook where that was a character, and I every single line I'd say it like nine different ways, and, <laughs> I and it was never it was... it was never Karen. I had to redo every single yeah. one of those. I always thought it was either Sharon or Char- yeah, Charon is what I yeah, always thought it was. That's the yeah. name of the moon of Pluto. Which uh, uh, technically, I think, is not actually a moon. It's also a planetoid or a planetina or a planetlet. Don't get me started. <laughs> anyway, this story story was previously published in Karen Coin uh-huh. Press's State of Horror Illinois anthology, and in issue three of the Creepy Campfire Quarterly by EMP Publishing. Eric Dean has a website, ericwrites.com, and you can see his drawings, short fiction. I think you can listen to his stories there, too. And you can make cheeky monkey comments there. Don't look at his bum, though. Yes, don't be a bum looker. (laughs) All right, so check the story out, and we'll talk more about it on the other uh, side. My Porcelain Monster by Eric Dean. Every kid is haunted by monsters. Some lie dormant just inches beneath the floor, under the bed. They rise through the carpet like a corpse from the earth, only at night, after the lights go out. They wait anxiously, emaciated muscles as tense as cables, waiting for a juicy little foot to swing carelessly over the edge of the bed. Some live in the closet, coiled up behind a pile of old sweaters. They watch, silently, through that space under the closet door, praying you'll accidentally leave it open just a crack, so they can peer out with curled lips and one wide bloodshot eye and claw restlessly at themselves while they watch you sleep. Still others would rather catch you at your most vulnerable. They stalk you even in the light, just over your shoulder at the blurry edge of your peripheral vision, streaks of shadow and subtle movements that you try to convince yourself you didn't see. They lie patiently and wait in the back seat of your car when you drive alone, waiting with rigid anticipation to spring up and tear the hair off of your head. They stand just behind you in the shower, haphazardly toothed mouths agape and preparing to shriek, bony fingers ready to grasp your throat as you close your eyes and wash the shampoo from your hair. But you open your eyes, just in time, and there's nothing there. There never is. You can't see or touch these monsters, and as kids grow up, they leave behind their monsters to torment the next generation of vivid imaginations. Well... I had a different kind of monster, and I couldn't shake him. I saw it every day of my life. I touched it, cold, hard, hungry. Nah, I wasn't molested or beaten. This isn't one of those stories. I loved my parents until he took them away from me. Okay, honey. It's time to feed the toilet monster. 
I was three years old, in the big blue house at North and Bevier, Aurora. To this day, I don't know if I actually remember this, or if I've just pieced it together from Mom's stories. But whatever. If it didn't happen this way, it might as well have. I stood at the open door of the bathroom, Mom gently pushing me from behind. The tiles were ice cold on my bare feet, and I wanted to turn around and retreat, but Mom's hand was firm against my back. I dropped my pajama pants and walked out of them, glancing back only once. Mom's smile was reassuring. The toilet monster was huge, and his one silver eye, long, squinted and discerning, stared expectantly from above his broad porcelain lips. Mom was with me. I felt safe, confident. I was a big boy, after all. I stood on the two phone books that she'd placed for me, climbed on, and wiggled until my tiny butt hung into the toilet monster's gaping lower jaw. I had to hold myself up on either side, but I'd done it. Feed the toilet monster, honey, she repeated, her hands clasped and her eyes shining with pride. I let loose with conviction, with purpose, sating his alleged hunger. That was the first and last time I ever used that upstairs bathroom. The very next day, well, I remember that day vividly in comparison. The paint on my memory's canvas is still wet, saturated in sickly greens and reds that quiver and crack at the edges, a little more with each replaying, like some old reel of eight-millimeter film that begs to be tossed in the fireplace. I awoke early the next morning, the morning that changed me. The air tasted burnt and buzzed with a curious energy even a three-year-old kid recognized as sinister. I butt-scooted carefully to the edge of my bed and lowered my feet onto the bridge of light streaming in from beneath my bedroom door. Three long steps and I was at the door, turning the flanged glass knob with both hands and hanging from it like a sock monkey until I'd pulled the door ajar. I crept down the hallway with terror in my guts. I still can't tell you why or what was driving me. Beneath the wandering eyes of an unfamiliar audience of framed strangers, past the baby-gated stairs that led down to the kitchen, past my parents' bedroom door, slightly open? Quietly, very quietly, I walked to the end of the hall. I stopped there and stared at the bathroom door, half open and blindingly bright to my sleepy eyes. I squinted against the light and peered, with one eye, through the spaces between my tiny fingers. I leaned into the door, but it wouldn't budge. I pushed again, harder, but something was blocking the door from the other side. I recognized the smell. My dad was using the bathroom. I shoved the door again and squeezed my body through the opening and into the bright, cramped bathroom, heavy with sensation. There, on the toilet, sat my father, slumped forward over his knees, the top of his bald head shining and his left leg leaning against the inside of the door. My dad always used this guest bathroom at my mother's behest. He was a big man, and when he did his business, it was big business. Daddy? He was naked. His face was down, and I couldn't see it, but his hands and feet were purple. Even at three, I knew it was all wrong. The sides of his face were bloated, swollen, and gray, and he didn't look real. He looked like someone else, someone vaguely like my father, but not human. Black blood dripped from his nose and pooled on the white tile around his feet, running in tiny rivers along the grout. I just stood and stared. Daddy? The last thing I remember is a scream. My mother's scream, so loud and piercing and haunting that I swear it stopped my heart and froze my blood solid. I remember hands clawing at me from behind, and then... nothing. The film in my head abruptly ends. 
mom said his heart just stopped working. And as a kid, that frightened me. I didn't realize a heart could just stop. I would lie awake at night for months, consciously feeling my own heartbeat, worried to tears that it might just stop. And then I'd turn purple and die, just like my dad, and mom would scream and lots of people would come to the house and cry. I didn't want that to happen. From then on, mom would take me into the master bedroom to use her bathroom. I never questioned it. That big white door at the end of the hall stayed shut, and not even guests were allowed in it. All guests would use the downstairs half-bath, even if they were staying overnight upstairs. She told people the plumbing was broken, and even put a piece of masking tape across the door, from frame to frame, like her own version of emotional crime scene tape. I didn't open the door, and neither did she. We passed it quietly, like a mausoleum, as if my father's corpse were still entombed inside. One night, two or three years later, I had a nightmare. I dreamed I was that small child again, struggling to push open the big white bathroom door, but at the same time horrified because I knew what lay on the other side. Still, my body acted without my consent, and shoved itself through the opening, just as it had that day. Inside, my father's bloated, discolored corpse sat lifeless and limp, just as it had on that day. Only, in this dream, my mother never came to rescue me. I was tense, fists clenched and teeth grinding, waiting for that scream, that scream that made my skin crawl and my hair stiffen. It never came. I continued staring at my father, and then his head began to rise. His hands, almost black, wiggled with tremors, and then his fat neck craned and slowly his face began to turn toward me. Dad? I whispered, my voice stifled by the thick air, almost like water around me, filling my lungs to near bursting with every breath. His face found mine, purple and misshapen, like some absurd clay caricature. His lips hung long and loose from his face, and his teeth spread out and waved like wind chimes. His big, pitted nose seemed to bobble and swing, like hot wax melting. He opened his eyes and stared at me. Cartoonish, glassy eyes, almost too big for his face, and as white and featureless as cue balls. I was frozen in place. My feet refused to respond, and the air was getting heavier around me, squeezing me and threatening to crush me. I struggled to move against it, but I couldn't. I tried to close my eyes, but I couldn't. My father chewed the air and gargled black blood through his piano key teeth, as if trying to speak to me. But before he could, he was suddenly sucked violently backward, his legs folded up around his head, and his body contorted and compressed while his arms flopped like dying fish. The toilet was sucking him down the drain. It chewed and crunched and gulped at him, consuming my dad ass first in a matter of seconds. The last thing to disappear into the bowl was his swollen face, twisted in horror, cue ball eyes staring straight at me. Blood sprayed upward out of the bowl in droplets on the tank, the walls, the white tile floor. Blood frothed out from under and over the seat and ran down every curve of the porcelain, gathering into a writhing, bubbling mass around the base of the toilet. The toilet crunched loudly from within, no doubt chewing his bones, and the black mass oozed steadily toward my tiny feet. I screamed silently, and my body ached with my need to move, to run, to escape from his bathroom and flee into my mother's arms at the other end of the hall. I couldn't. The black ooze enveloped my feet, cold, viscous, and stinging with pins and needles as if my feet had fallen asleep at its touch. It grabbed tightly and began to pull. Suddenly, I was sliding across the tile, standing upright and gliding slowly toward the toilet bowl. The toilet was growing, taller, wider, 
pressing outward on the walls of the tiny bathroom and expanding in diagonals like a German expressionist film. A deafening ringing stabbed into my ears, and I began to feel choked, so tightly that I thought my eyeballs would burst. Every molecule in my body was screaming to get free, and yet I was helpless. The toilet bowl, now at eye level, began to move, to undulate, and lean toward me as I slid on the soles of my feet to meet it, until I could see straight into it. The water didn't pour out. It stayed firmly in the bowl, spinning like a black whirlpool that seemed to stretch infinitely into the void of space. The ringing in my ears became fractured, roughly textured, and wet, like a toilet flushing, but more... organic. The toilet monster had eaten my father, and now it was going to eat me. Just as my head was being pulled into the darkness, I heard it, from somewhere in the void, beyond the black whirlpool. That scream, that ice-cold, splintered bone, curdled blood shriek that tore through my mother's throat so many years ago. It came from all around me, from inside the toilet monster. It was coming from me. I awoke screaming at the top of my lungs, drenched in sweat and a hot puddle of my own urine and feces, my mother tearing into my room in a flowing white nightgown like a pale, gaunt specter in full flight. We moved out of the house the next week and stayed with my mother's parents across town in Boulder Hill until we eventually got our own small place just down the street from them. I never had the dream again nor did I see the house again for many years. As I grew, I would find out that my father had actually died of a massive heart attack due to his weight and bad health, and his body had been there for many hours before I'd found him. He was 38. I would also learn that my grandparents had taken over the mortgage payments in the hopes that someone in the family would want the house again, the big house my grandparents had raised my mother in before giving it to my parents as a wedding present only two years before I was born. No one ever did. I'd been a late baby for my parents, who didn't marry until they were both in their thirties, a first marriage for both, and I, the only child, a miracle for my mother who'd been told she wasn't able to conceive. My grandparents were also older, and eventually could no longer afford the payments on two houses, nor were they physically able to live in a two-story house. When I was fifteen, my mother decided to rent out the big house at North and Bevier to offset the cost. She would go there for two or three hours every day for a week after she left work in downtown Aurora, just to clean and repaint. I wanted to help, but I always found a reason not to. Baseball practice, homework, helping the grandparents, or just not feeling up to it. Still... I would always promise to come and help soon. On the fifth day of cleaning, a Friday, I got off the bus at home and found my dinner waiting in the oven. Mom had left a note. Cleaning the old house. Turn the oven off. I'll be home at eight. I love you. Mom. The guilt of not helping my mother was crippling. I knew it was wrong, but I was still afraid of that place. I knew it was ridiculous. I knew monsters weren't real, and I knew my dad's death was a consequence of his own bad choices, and nothing more. I knew these things, and yet... I couldn't stomach the thought of going back there. In an effort to ease the weight of the guilt, I cleaned out our own small house that evening. I scrubbed our one happy toilet, and I washed every window. I did the laundry, the dishes, and even swept the driveway, which is when I noticed the sunset. How long had it been? 8.30. She was a half hour late. That wasn't like her. It was before the age of cell phones, and I wasn't yet old enough to drive, so I had only two options. Either call the old house, or just wait patiently. Mom hadn't set up phone service at the old house again yet, so I waited. At nine o'clock, I phoned my grandparents down the street. Hello? Grandma, it's me. Mom isn't home from the old house yet. 
She left a note saying she'd be here an hour ago. I'm sure she's fine, honey. She probably stopped to get groceries or just lost track of time over there. Don't worry. All right. I love you. Love you too, honey. 9.30 came and went. 10 o'clock came. My guts twisted. Hello? Grandpa, it's me. It's late. Your grandma and I were in bed. Is everything okay? Mom's still not home. I see. I'll come pick you up in just a minute. Let's head over and see what's keeping her. Thank you, Grandpa. Grandpa pulled up five minutes later in his big blue Oldsmobile, dressed in a burgundy bathrobe with pajama pants underneath. Get in, little man, he said with a smile. But I could see the worry behind it. I was still dressed in my clothes from school. I hadn't even taken my sneakers off. We took Broadway along the Fox River to the old house. We spent ten minutes in silence. The tension was palpable, but every couple of minutes Grandpa would glance at me and smile reassuringly. I was glad to have him there. I trusted his strength. The old streets were so familiar, though I hadn't seen them in so many years. We approached the big blue house along north, and as we rounded the corner onto Bevier, Mom's sedan was parked in the driveway. There, see? Grandpa said through a smile. We pulled in behind her and got out. The house was smaller than I remembered, and it seemed dry and tired, slouching and sagging under the weight of its emptiness. Grandpa walked straight to the door and let himself inside, leaving his driver's side car door open. I hurried to catch up. Once inside, I was stopped in mid-step by a flood of memories. The house was empty, but the ghosts of old furniture faded in and out of existence in my mind's eye. I hadn't thought about this place in years, and hadn't been here since I was tiny, but I knew exactly where things had been. I knew the colors of the curtains and the way the magazines would stack on the oak coffee table. I knew where the Christmas tree stood and where my parents would sit to watch television. My grandpa emerged from the kitchen with a slightly worried look. Then he suddenly smiled at me. The place looks clean. Your mom's doing a great job. He continued toward the stairs, but stopped at the bottom and called my mom's name up the narrow stairwell. No answer. He called again, louder, with the slightest edge of panic in his voice. No answer. Something grabbed me by the heart and pulled me forward. I ran toward the stairs, slipped past my grandpa and took the stairs two at a time. He called after me, but I didn't stop. I just ran. There, at the top of the stairs, I saw the light streaming from the open door of the guest bathroom, cutting a diagonal line across the dark brown shag carpet that crooked and crept up the far wall. I topped the stairs and rounded the corner to the left, and time slowed. I moved as if in a dream, effortlessly, gracefully. I hovered inches above the floor and glided into the bathroom holding half a breath. There, on the white tile, in a puddle of fresh crimson blood, lay my mother. Her eyes were half open, but rolled up, and her body was contorted as she lay on her back on the small floor, yellow rubber gloves on her hands, and bottles of cleaning chemicals strewn about. I fell to her side and grabbed her face. I must have been screaming, but I heard nothing. Hands. They grabbed at me from behind again. They pulled me, but I refused to let go. Strong, thick hands lifted me away from my mother and back out into the darkness of the hallway. I turned to see my grandfather, red-faced and gasping for breath. His lips formed words, but I couldn't hear them. He stood taller than I've seen him in years, and his eyes weren't panicked at all. He looked strong and full of authority. He looked at my mother for only a second before pushing me gently to one side and easing himself painfully down to her side. He clutched her face and neck in his hands. He turned to me. More words. He turned back to her and slapped her face gently, his lips moving. He turned to me again. More words. Firm, hard words. I still couldn't hear them. 
He repeated them, and as if echoing from faraway walls, I heard the softest reverberation of, Get help! I stood for only a second. I saw my mother's eyelids flutter, and her eyes rolled forward and looked at my grandfather, and then at me. And I ran. I ran downstairs and out the front door. I ran into the dark, silent street, and I froze. Where do I get help? Who is here to help me? In the midst of the moment, an image rose up from the dark basement of my brain, an image of a giant living toilet with a black whirlpool in its throat. The sound of a scream from beyond the void grew louder and louder. White light grew in intensity around me until I felt like I was going to pass out. I turned to the left. Headlights. The scream became a car horn. There I was, standing in the middle of Bevier, while a truck sat only a few feet away, headlights flashing, horn blaring. I couldn't see into the windshield, and I did the one thing I knew to do. Help! I don't know if I screamed at once, or a thousand times, but in seconds a man had emerged from the truck and grabbed me by the shoulders, demanding to know what was wrong. I pointed to the open door of the old house. My mom! She needs help! The man ran toward the old house. Neighbors had appeared from their houses to investigate the commotion. One of them took me into the front yard of the old house and hugged me. The man ran back out from my house and spoke with some of the neighbors. They hurried into their respective houses. Still others gathered in groups and talked quietly, staring at me with confusion and worry. Distant sirens grew louder. Lights, police, paramedics, my mother on a stretcher. She'll be okay, one of them said. She's alive. She'll be okay. My grandfather guided me to his car and buckled me in. My grandparents and I sat silently in the waiting room of the Aurora Medical Center until dawn. One doctor emerged and told us she was talking, but with difficulty. They said she remembered cleaning and getting lightheaded. The police said she'd likely passed out from the fumes and fallen backward, splitting the back of her head open on the edge of the toilet bowl. Later, a doctor would approach cautiously and tell us that her brain was swelling and that she needed surgery immediately. Still later, they'd say that parts of her brain had been severely affected by the trauma and that her vitals weren't stabilizing. At some point around dawn, they told us she'd passed. The rest of that year is pretty much a blur. There was a lot of crying and hugging. There was a funeral. More crying and hugging. I moved in with my grandparents in Boulder Hill, and it was a while before I went back to school. But I did go back. To be honest, I can't really remember much of it. I slept a lot. I guess I did most of the things a normal kid does. I wasn't irreparably damaged by the loss of my parents. If anything, I felt numb. I didn't have any more nightmares after that. Hell, I didn't really dream at all anymore. I lived, I worked, I played, I loved, and I lost. Life goes on. My grandparents sold both my mother's house in Boulder Hill and our old blue house at North and Bevier, and used the money to send me to Bradley University in Peoria, my grandpa's alma mater. I graduated with decent grades and a business degree and moved to Chicago. I've been married and divorced since then, though I've never had a kid of my own. I wasn't averse to it. It just never felt right. I visited my grandparents on the holidays until they died, two years apart, of various natural causes. They died comfortably and happily, my grandfather asleep in his own bed, and my grandmother in a hospital, surrounded by family. They died respectfully with dignity. After my grandparents died, I didn't have much reason to go back to Aurora. So, I've never been back. It's been about five years now, I think. I never would have gone back, either. Hell, I wouldn't have done a lot of things if not for that goddamn news article. Hey, didn't you grow up there? Did you know that guy? My co-worker slid the newspaper in front of me and pressed a greasy finger just below the headline, Father of Four Commits Suicide. 
I read the name. No, I didn't know him. I started to slide the paper away from my ham and cheese sandwich until my eye caught the fuzzy black and white photo near the bottom of the article. An ambulance was parked outside of an old two-story house that seemed to sag beneath its own weight. I slid the paper back toward me and started to read the article. Police say his body was discovered in an upstairs bathroom. I slid the paper away. That night, I dreamed. It was the first dream I can remember in fifteen years. A long hallway with brown shag carpet. God, no. A big white door, so much taller than me and widening at the top and leaning out over me like a surreal authoritarian. Blinding white light streaming from a widening crack. Please, not this. I am being pulled toward the light. My tiny feet aren't even touching the ground. My stiff body is being held aloft and moved slowly forward, through the door. I struggle, but I am weak. I can't move. Someone, please wake me up. I move into the bathroom. My ears are ringing painfully. My skin tingles and my face begins to burn with a feverish heat. My eyes adjust to the room. The angles are wrong. There are no parallel lines here. The walls, ceiling, and floor are warped and stretched, breathing and pulsing with every heavy beat of my heart. The tile floor is a discordant mosaic of sterile, white, misshapen tiles. In a distant corner sits the toilet. It twists on its bolts to face me. The floor between us begins to shorten, although neither of us are moving. God, please don't make me see this again. A sudden squeaking, a jarring screech of rubber across wet tile. I turn my head to see my mother. Her body is long and slack, as if her joints aren't fastened correctly. She slides across the long tile floor as if pulled violently by an unseen hand. It slings her side to side in a serpentine trail across the impossibly long floor, leaving a wide, cherry-red trail of streaking blood behind her. Her bright yellow rubber gloves clutch wildly at the tile, but find no purchase. Her legs wobble and flop like snakes as her body slides like a strawberry blonde mop. Her skin is as white as the tile, her eyes open but empty, lifeless and brilliantly white. She suddenly stops at my feet and falls limp. The bathroom has become small around us, crushing us. The toilet is there, right in front of us, larger than life and vibrating with an electric intensity that prevents me from looking directly at it without feeling nauseous. I see the lid in my periphery slam open as the toilet begins to warp and lean over toward us. The bowl grows wide that familiar black hole of swirling darkness. My mother's body begins to slide in, squeaking rubber and streaking blood across white tile. Her arm suddenly shoots out straight and her yellow-gloved hand grabs my ankle in a vice. Her pale face lifts up to me, twisted in disgust, her white eyes burning. She speaks without moving her lips and the whispered words echo inside my skull. Why didn't you come help me? I awake screaming in wet, warm sheets. I pull up slow and park my car alongside the curb on Bevier. Pulling into the driveway doesn't feel right. This isn't my house. I mean, technically it was. Is. It took me all of six months to get the house again. After what happened... The family was eager to sell. They took my first offer. I closed this morning. I rub the key between my thumb and forefinger and glance up at the house and just as quickly look away. This isn't my home anymore. I hadn't bothered to get the utilities turned on. I wouldn't be staying that long. I step out onto the street the pale green streetlight hums and tiny bits of gravel crunch between my feet and the cracked concrete. I pop the trunk. The warm yellow light is comforting, and for an instant, I consider crawling in, closing the lid, 
and hiding until morning. I take a deep breath. I need this. I put the key between my lips. Its bitterness seems fitting. I pick up the battery-powered lantern in my left hand, the tag still hanging from the handle, and pick up the duffel bag in my right. I'm trying not to think too far ahead about what I'm doing here. I keep my plans short. Simple. One foot in front of the other. Face the door and walk. Step up on the curb. Deep breath. I put the bag down long enough to unlock the door. My right arm is shaking. Another deep breath. Put the key in slowly. Turn. The lock sticks. I turn it harder. Click. The door swings open on an empty house. The creak echoes through empty rooms, waking up the spirits of old furniture, familiar paint, the distant sounds of ancient, indiscernible voices, like wind through the trees. Up the stairs that seem to last forever. Two. Three. Four. I count the steps to keep my mind blank. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. The lantern emits a hot white light that shines through the banister posts. A chorus line of dancing shadows on the far wall to the right. The weight of the duffel bag tugs at my shoulder. I reach the top of the stairs. Deep breath. I turn slowly to my left. The door. Still white. It seems... So much smaller now. I stare at the knob for a few moments. With one motion, I slide the large handle of the lantern over my hand and onto my wrist, and I open the door with my left hand. Immediately, I let it slide back down into my hand, and I hold it up between me and... and... an empty bathroom. White tile. I step inside. I close the door with my foot. And there it is. A cold shiver dances across my ribs, and my breath falters. The same toilet. It also seems... so goddamn small. The lantern light falls across its curves, casting shadows like wrinkles across its aging face. I knew you'd come. It seems to say to me, I haven't forgotten you. I look up and see the pellet holes and staining in the popcorn ceiling. I set down my lantern and duffel bag and draw the tab down the long, loud zipper. I dreamed about you last night, I say aloud. I didn't realize how much I'd grown. I reach inside the duffel and pull out my grandfather's rusted sledge. It was one of the few things I kept from the estate sale. I didn't know why at the time, but now, standing here, holding it in my sweating hands, twisting my palms across the lacquered wood handle, it all makes sense. For the first time, I stare into his one chrome eye and take a deep, slow breath. I am not afraid. I tell him so. I'm not afraid of you. He is silent. I hold the sledge high above my head, and I clench my teeth and growl, bringing it down hard and smashing the toilet tank into two pieces that fall off on either side. I raise it again, this time shattering the plastic toilet seat and knocking a large piece of the bowl off the right side. I raise it again, and again, and again, and again. I smash the toilet down to the bolts. I smash every piece until no bit is larger than my palm. I'm heaving, choking, crying aloud. Tears roll down my face and spit hangs from my lips and strings. I can't stop. I cry for my father, and I cry for the mother I never mourned. I cry for a terrified child too small to face his fear. I fall to my knees and I weep over the battered, dismembered corpse of my monster. And for the first time in my life, I feel like a man. I close the door behind me. 
the air is clean, and I breathe it through the smile of a free man. The pale green streetlight hums, and the night sky greets me like a brother. I walk tall toward the soft yellow light of my open trunk. The world seems a little smaller. I know I'll sleep like a baby tonight. The end. All right, everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. So, how did we come by this story that was on Karen Coin? What was it? Karen Coin something? Karen Coin Presses, State of Horror, colon, Illinois. Oh, Illinois. I'm pretty sure Illinois is how you pronounce it. That's how you pronounce it? Okay. So, Um, it's Charon in Illinois. Charon sounds just so much better than Karen. Yeah. My neighbor growing up was Karen. But she didn't spell it like that? No, hell no. <laughs> Nobody spells it like that. <laughs> Unless you're Greek. I think that's what it takes. So, yeah, Eric contacted me a few months back and asked if I would narrate a story of his, produce it, you know, and and he could have it on his website. He could have it on YouTube. He could have it tattooed on his right lower thigh. And I did it. it was, the story was called The Black Meat. Okay, quite enough of that, please. (laughs) It's too late. Everybody already turned the file off. They've already skipped to the next one. (laughs) There's somebody that hated that sound and said they had to turn off the show when they heard it. (laughs) Anyway, he liked what I, I did with it, and he asked me to do it with another story, and he asked me to do it with another story after that, and I really appreciated the work. And uh, one of the stories that he had me do was this one, was My Porcelain Monster. And after I had recorded it, I, I, it really reminded me of the conversations you and I have had about uh, that a good Fecal writer... Fecal matter? <laughs> no? I, I tend to have those conversations with myself. <laughs> no, the conversations that you and I have had on this show are that a good writer can make anything scary. Uh, We tried to test that theory. I wrote a story about evil moths. And you wrote a story about a malevolent child's balloon. And I just felt like, wow, this story fits right in there. Um, I I wouldn't have guessed that you could write a serious story about a killer toilet. It would just be... The idea is just too comical, too ludicrous. (laughs) Uh, And yet I, I, I felt like... There is a good amount of dread and, and yeah, true threat from this toilet in the story. <laughs> and, and yeah, you don't, you don't laugh. It's not, uh, it's grim. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty creepy. He does a really good job with the language and the imagery and stuff. And I think mostly he succeeds because he kind of sort of skips around the fact that it's a toilet. You know what I mean? He spends more time on the dead body of the person who was killed and the creepy dream in which that person grabs his ankle and pulls him. Or they're being sucked in, you know, slowly and folded in half. And, you know, the, the really gross stuff along those lines. And here and there when... <laughs> When he mentions the toilet, uh, it makes you chuckle slightly. You know what I mean? Like, you're, oh yeah, toilet. But yeah, there were moments in that story where, like, his imagery was super scary. And it was super, uh, I don't know, it reminded me a lot of, like, a Stephen King story or something like that. It was really well done. I see, King had a, a talent for taking whatever, whether it's a little boy or a St. Bernard or a laundry press, you know, uh, and making it scary. I think he would probably agree with me that a good writer could make anything scary. And, and it, yeah, it would be a fun challenge in the future for other stuff, too. It's like, oh, dude, you can't make a diaper scary. I was like, well, you've never smelled my son's diapers. 
Uh, I did ask Eric to do an author's note. But we haven't done a Dunes Tooth in so long we forgot to uh, Oh yeah. To run it. If announcer man were here, what would he say? Author's note. Oh. Sure. Yeah, it's the author's note. Yeah, okay. He wrote As for the origin and meaning of the story, the story started with a nightmare that I had, which was one of the nightmares that the protagonist has during the story, but I won't tell you which one. I built the story around that nightmare. And I wanted to do two things. First, I wanted to create a monster that was entirely in the head of the protagonist, but was still a legitimate villain to the reader. And I took it a step further by trying to make that villain the most ridiculous thing I could think of. Not just an inanimate object, but a toilet. I guess I'm making a statement that horror is all in your perception. Yeah, I kind of like the the idea where he... It was like the you know the, they had the potty training scene where let's feed the toilet monster, and then from then on the toilet was a monster, and I kind of liked just the idea of the imagination of the child or of a person could imbue something with power or something like that. I don't know. It makes I, I did the story a while back, which will run on the Dune Steve at some point soon. Nice about a baby whose nightmares or whose dreams manifest in the real world. And I, I, I kind of think that's a cool idea. It's similar to this where, you know, I don't know if that, that's what gave the toilet its power. Was the child, you know, turning it into a monster? Or, you know, how where what the origin of it was. Um... Seems like maybe that's what he was going for, but I don't know. Maybe I misread it. But um, that that was something that um, sparked a little imagination in me, made me want to do a story similar. Well, yeah, see, it, it never occurred to me that the toilet wasn't an evil force, that it could have been all in his head. It sort of makes me want to re- read it with that in mind and see. I mean, because if, if it were, it was all in his head this is the unluckiest guy on the face of the earth just coincidentally both of his parents happened to die and some guy who moved in the house later as well all in the same place coincidentally i mean there were alternate explanations for their deaths you know the father had a he was having- heart attack the mother mixed cleaning fluids and suffocated on the fumes it could have been just in his head and just a coincidence. That's one of those things that, uh, you know, people tend to do if there are coincidences. Well, they can't just be coincidences. You have to figure out the connection, understand the pattern, because people make patterns out of things. That's what we do. That's why we've become what we are. That's why we've put men on the moon and or landed spaceships on comets is because we can do that kind of stuff. Sometimes there's just not a pattern. It's just, you know, coincidence. So I don't know. Maybe that's what this was. I I just feel like, what is the guy going to do? I mean, he bought this house and then went in and smashed the toilet. I noticed that he never turned the water off to the toilet. So this thing's got to be leaking all over the place now. So there's going to be some severe water damage. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think he's going to plan to just sell it now that he's done smashing the toilet? He's like, all right. I've had my fun. Anybody else want this house? Well, you've got to wonder how sane the guy is at this point. The mind can only take so much, and perhaps everything works out fine now that the toilet is gone, but I didn't really get that impression from the end of the story. It just it, He said he felt better than he had in years or something like that at the end, though. Uh, well, okay. You think he's just going to start obsessing about something else? Or he's going to be like, there's still shards out there. There's still little chunks of porcelain. I've got to pound them all to dust. Well, we don't have an explanation as to how this happened with the toilet. I mean, it could really just be the house and its focal point was right there in the bathroom. And you're going to find out that, yeah, it's the problem is not solved by smashing the toilet. Or he could live happily ever after. And, you know, he finally gets to start to live now and... 
experience the joys that most people take for granted. I, I guess it's up to you to interpret the story how you like. If you're big Anglovich, you interpret it badly. Um, I, I would invite the listener to give us suggestions of something that uh, is ridiculous or unscary. Yeah. That it would be interesting to see somebody try and make scary. Maybe that's not going to go anywhere, but you never know. I would be yeah, curious. It's, it's interesting. I wonder when it was. Because like clowns, for example, are things that people are really scared of these days but they're supposed to be happy fun little goofy things that make you laugh at the circus and they do silly things and how did that change you know where did the where did the clown suddenly take a a left turn and become a, a creepy thing and become it and become the insane clown posse and become ronald Ronald, yeah. Sorry. I mean, Ronald McDonald is like the mascot that's supposed to make kids want a Happy Meal, you know. But now clowns are like the Joker and his crazy crew of bad guys and et cetera, et cetera. Like, where did that take that left turn? Was it just somebody taking something that wasn't supposed to be scary and turning it on its on its head and making it really, really scary? Or is it always something that was just scary and people, you know, were able to see beyond it and, oh, clowns are funny-ish. Were they they always a little creeped out about it and all it took was just a little push and now all of a sudden clowns are the scariest things out there and people will just put on clown makeup and stand on the street and people will call the cops because that's so scary. There's a guy in a clown suit standing there doing nothing. I wonder about that. What do you think? Well, I think the operator has to say, I'm sorry, sir, the clown is is in your house. So where is your, where is this clown doing nothing? In my bathroom. I paid him to do something and he's not doing it. (laughs) Is there anything that you can, I mean, we did a balloon, which has no volition. It's not, it, it can't possibly be scary. We did moths, which uh, a lot of people are already scared of. We knew that ahead of time because we talked about it in one of our 13 nights of Halloween. And some people are creeped out by them for some reason. Uh, I'm not particularly scared of them, but I don't want to touch them. Oh, I love moths. They're kind of dusty and and they have that weird dust that comes off from them and they're just kind of gross. But most bugs are kind of that way. you got to be a bug person. I think, to really get into handling them. Sometimes, and that's one of those things I think that people like to do. I know that like my daughter, for example, when she was young, dude, she loved bugs and she would pick them up and play with them and I have a picture of her with this big praying mantis on her hand and just how neat she thought that was. And now, oh, I guarantee you, she wouldn't come anywhere near a praying mantis. And if she did, she'd probably just squash it. But what changed? What I don't know. With the onset of puberty, all of her childlike wonder faded away. It could be. I think it's more a cultural thing, to tell you the truth. Just, you know, you're you're taught to be scared of bugs by way of TV and movies. And all your friends tell you bugs are gross. And so you're like, oh, well, then I guess bugs are gross. I'm not going to touch them anymore because all my friends will make fun of me if I do. Or they'll run away from me and scream or what. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from, but yeah, over time, it, she was just not interested in going anywhere near them anymore, except for to squash them. Yeah, bugs can't are, are in general uh, easy to... All you need to do is get enough of them. <laughs> a cockroach, yeah, it's gross, but no big deal. But a thousand cockroaches coming out from under the rug. I don't, I don't really see a difference between a thousand cockroaches and a cockroach. I don't know, but I have a visceral uh, reaction to cockroaches that I don't with spiders or... or praying mantises? Or praying, or, no, definitely not praying mantises. Well, what if a thousand praying mantises came out? I don't know. And they all are just like... <laughs> doing that weird walking, crawling Maybe stuff. you'd have to gather. I, I'll give you that challenge to gather me a thousand praying mantises and, and we'll see. And set them free in a room On with me, you? yeah. I don't start know, flying but, at once. Everybody has something 
I think, that they're afraid of that's irrational, that doesn't, that's, you know, that's not actually dangerous. And not but bothers scare them. other people. But like, like, for example, one of the things that disturbs me are old photographs of people from like the 1800s. There's something like a doll's eyes about the way that people's eyes were in these photographs. And I don't understand what it is. <laughs> Because you, people, because evolution does not work that way. We can't have changed that much in just, you know, 150 years. Uh -huh. Have you ever but, read about the creepy thing that people used to do in, with old timey photos? Like say somebody's child died and they never had a picture of it. So they would like pose the body and even like all, everybody gathers around and puts their arms around it or whatever. And then they'll take a picture. So they have... A picture to and uh, yeah, that, that's a pretty creepy thing. That's seriously upsetting to me. That that idea. Um, but yes, I I have heard that the photographs were so expensive that people could afford to get a photograph taken when they got married or when they died, and that was it. You know, it, especially when you know if a child died or something like that. It's like, well, this is your own. We you know, our only picture of this, this is the only way we'll have to remember this person by and. Oh, yeah, the, the set it, propping up a dead child with a, a toy or, you know, oh, gosh, I can't even fudge imagine sitting with your dead child or your parents. And uh, yeah, that you don't need a great talent to make that terrifying. <laughs> um, <laughs> Most definitely. Uh, but is there anything? That, well, I guess you mentioned moths, but th is there something else that, that just frightens you that doesn't frighten most people? You know, like cockroaches are a thing that I have a visceral problem with as well. Uh, and some of the really, really big ones. And the fact that they can fly, that's just awful. I think the, the, sometimes we'll go to conventions or something and they'll be animal people. And they, they'll bring like those great big Madagascar cockroaches. And those don't upset me nearly as much as the little tiny the kind that you find, you know, in cities and in garbage dumpsters and stuff. I, I, I don't, I don't know. There's something, there's a novelty to the great big cockroach that it almost makes it look like a toy or a wind up or, you know, it's not, it's not real. No cockroach could really be that big kind of thing. They are. I've seen them in real life, not in a convention. <laughs> There are some, some really... Cre and that's one of those weird things. Like, if you can get something... Like a praying mantis. Like, the, a praying mantis flying is kind of creepy. Just because it's so big to begin with. Um, something like that. F then flying just... I, I don't know. Or a great big cockroach just suddenly lifting off the ground and flying. You know, there's so many insects that fly... Just beetles, like all beetles pretty much fly, I, I, I think. I think that's part of the whole thing of being a beetle is having the wings down under the the shell. And yeah, I mean like a dung beetle. I've never seen a dung beetle in real life, but you know, I saw it on A Bug's Life. But yeah, you know, those things just popping open the shell and taking off and lifting off into the air. I don't know, something about that scares me. It's way too mobile for something like, you know, I should be able to just walk up to that thing and step on it if I want to. <laughs> the fact that it can just launch into the air and then come at my face or something, that's not okay. But insects that fly as their main mode of transportation, like a dragonfly or a fly or a... Butterfly. butterfly those don't bother you it's the other it's like like a flying grasshopper right it's, 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 does that fall in the it's category like of that the... that you expect to stay down okay i mean grasshoppers obviously they hop hence the name but yeah the ones that hop and then fly and so they don't just hop they take great leaps and i guess when it comes down to it, they're not really scary because they don't come after you but you could make them scary. Birds don't come after you too until they do in a movie and then it's a horror classic. You know, if you were to do the same thing with bugs. And there are some creepy bugs out there, you know. There's big, there's, there's crickets that just swarm in astonishing amounts. 
And there's, I want to say they're called June bugs, like in Texas. That they're just everywhere, and you drive just down the road, and your whole wind windshield is just getting sh- blotted out because you're just hitting so many of them because they're all in transit at once. Uh, you know that kind of stuff is just you could easily you know the sky being darkened the sun darkened because there's so many crickets in motion or locusts or whatever you know that that can be pretty creepy dung beetles dung beetles yes a whole giant swarm of them rolling a gigantic piece of dung what's brown and sounds like a bell uh well well i was gonna say we got off track but we came back to dung so you know i think that's probably (laughs) there we go where we meant to go were you drawn to this story because of your (laughs) scatological bent was it because of your uh special collection of stories never trust a fart i don't think so no i I mean, I found the story to be pretty unpleasant from the very beginning. Let's time to feed the toilet monster. It's just that's upsetting. Just that idea of <laughs> some uh, monster that's just waiting for you to shit in its mouth. No, well, just the, that you would say that the, that's a euphemism for defecation or whatever. I just I uh. and yeah, it's, Daddy was a big man, and so it was big business when he made his business or whatever. It's just. That's that's uh, yeah not not really my thing, I don't know but yeah maybe it singled itself out because of that subject but mostly I just yeah I wanted to talk about making unscary stuff scary and that I don't know the, we we've seen it with many times in movies where the the antagonist in a slasher movie or whatever is just ridiculous they're 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 Chucky Chucky is a good example I mean I didn't think those movies were worth anything until they decided to make a funny one. And I was like, why? Hey, this is really solid. Because, yeah, I, I, even as a little boy, Chucky wasn't scary to me. I've heard stories of people who were scared of Chucky when they were little. So, you know, I think it all depends on who you are and your experience, I guess. Yeah, but at the same, I mean, I, I don't think the way they did it with uh, the, you know, the possessed good guy doll worked. But you could take that same premise and, and make it scary, you know, like a, a Annabelle, that doll one. There was one with Lauren Cohen where there were these parents that called her over to, to sit their child and it turned out the child was just a, a doll that they would dress and feed. And I found that to be slightly unsettling as well. I didn't see the movie, but I was just like, ugh, because it was the uncanny valley, you know, it's like you get close enough to an actual person and it stops being cute or whatever. My grandmother had this statue, and I, I know I must have talked about it because we always talk about this around Halloween time, things that were scary as kids. Uh, not a statue, but what would you call it? What is that thing if it were figurine? made of por- porcelain? Okay. Let's say a figurine, yeah. Uh, and it was of a little child in, like, timeout that was up against the wall they had their arms against the wall and their head on, against their arms waiting to be told that they could go back and play or whatever. And that really <laughs> creeped me out. Just the, uh, the It was lifelike. It was meant to be amusing that she's got a kid being punished or whatever against the wall. But yeah, it, it was so easy to imagine it deciding that it wasn't in timeout anymore and start to move or start to look around and that. And yeah, it's just... Anything can be scary if, if done well, if, if the proper attention, if the f- proper frame of mind is, is used. Yeah, that's interesting. There's a uh, show on Netflix right now called Troll Hunter. I want to say Kelsey Grammer does the voice of one of the uh, trolls. Anyways, um, there's in this world, there's two mythical creatures. There's trolls and there's gnomes. And the gnomes are really little. And they look just like garden gnomes, except for they're like this terrible pest problem. You know, they're like basically the rats of the troll world. And the kid sees the gnomes like, oh, look at the gnome, they're so cute. And it's like, Rah! and it's got like these, you know, it still looks just like a gnome, except for that. Yeah. And then its face gets angry and it's got like these pointy filed down, you know, really scary teeth. And it just comes after him. And it's like, ah, 
funny to take, you know, something as completely harmless looking as a gnome and do something like that with it, you know, take it that cute. It'd be like taking a Tinkerbell kind of a fairy and then somehow making it just completely evil and awful somehow. You know, something that's supposed to be cute and ding a ding a bink and you know, it doesn't even talk, it just jingles. <laughs> you know. So I don't know, something like that. But you could write an evil Tinkerbell Tinkerbell story. You could write an evil elf on the shelf story. <laughs> and yeah, how the lawsuit would flow, but still there is potential in that. And yeah, I can't really see it in my mind's eye, but the idea of looking out your window and there are several lawn gnomes you know, slowly moving toward the house could be scary. Yeah, I think anything like that that should be just a little statue, especially like that one that you're talking about with the the child in timeout kind of a thing. Uh, I don't know. Like, I'm looking, I have all these figures on my bookshelf here. Um, I don't know. For some reason, they... Maybe they would be super creepy if they said, like, did you you remember the movie from the 80s? I believe it was called The Gate. Mm. Where there was a bunch of really small little... Like goblin things. Yeah, that came through some gate. And there were these tiny little things. But there was a bunch of them and they uh, had evil on their minds. And uh, they had like were attacking some kid and the kid had to fight against them. I don't know, I guess that's what I imagine... As I look at all these figures and imagine them coming to life. Maybe it's because they're so small that they seem too well, small to yeah, be harmful. Your G.I. Joes seem like they'd be harmless. But turning on a light in the night because you heard a sound and they're crawling up your bed spread and they have needles in their little hands would be terrifying. Uh-huh. Especially, you know, because you know where they're going to put those needles. Anything could be scary with the right mindset, the right direction. You get attacked. Like, like you, you've got a, a Woody and a Buzz I that are just have, uh, so... We don't need to talk about that on the show. I mean, oh, you're talking about the toy. You have a toy from Toy Story, <laughs> those two characters. And they're just, they're, they're delightful and people love them. And uh, one of them is Tom Hanks. And so how could you ever be afraid of it? But... They could be scary. Just just a tiny little, yeah. uh, just a they, tiny bit more realism in the face. Uh-huh. And where you get closer to that Polar Express factor. Uh-huh. They scared the hell and, out of Sid, so. You know, if it were saying things that it shouldn't be saying and moving of their own volition, I think even a grown man would be afraid of Woody and Buzz. It just, I, I guess I, I'm trying to do writing exercises <laughs> here of how do you make x scary but you get that's the whole point by an of this army episode. of lego minifigures <laughs> well they're heading for the rectum so you're you're yes <laughs> they, they become terrifying I, somebody out there more talented than me could do a lego minifigure horror f- story and, <laughs> and it would work yeah the, well they came out with a whole series of them that were monsters so already just that adds to it Kim Jong-il Ed Gein Donald (laughs) Trump (laughs) you're just like what anyhow I I don't know if this is the end of another episode but it is another episode so uh, we're doing better this year than we did last yeah how about that okay well hey I want to thank Eric Dean he uh he was happy to hear that I wanted to do this story on the show and uh yeah food for thought it's been nice to be able to do it. We're, thanks for uh, for letting us do your story. It's been fun. If people want to donate to the show, feel free to do that. There's a link right there at the top of the page. And uh, we appreciate your donations. Yeah. We really do. And hopefully soon we'll have some kind of Patreon thing going as well. So that'll be awesome. Thanks for, uh, for joining us again for another episode, folks. And uh, we'll see you again hopefully very soon. I have been Rich Outfield. And I've been Big Anklevich. Don't forget to flush. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two.
If you want, I think he just says... I knew you'd come. I haven't forgotten you. <laughs> I am the killer toilet. And you will die. Skull. 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 Win the battle. Lose the war. Time to feed the toilet monster. No! Oh, you weren't recording. <laughs> Stay. Bark, bark, quack, tail. Good boy. Good boy. Uh, really big? Seriously? <laughs>